Hello everybody. If you have a sump pump or a sewage pump, it's probably sitting in a pit that looks something like this. And it has a pipe or two coming out of it and a check valve and wiring. If you have what I refer to as a piggyback float switch, it's basically a float switch on the end of a wire and the float runs up and down with the level of the water and you've had it fail, you know what a pain in the butt it can be to get this thing open and replace the float switch. It's not such a nasty job in a sump pit, but when you have a float failure in a sewage pit, it is a real, pardon the expression, pain in the ass to fix and it's a nasty job. So the last time mine failed about seven or eight years ago, I decided to make a modification to it. And that modification has performed exceptionally well. And I'm getting ready to do the same modification on somebody else's, so I thought I would document it for you. Many of these floats have either mercury switches, mercury reed switches, or mini switches or micro switches inside them triggered by a ball or just triggered by the angle of the float. And the contacts in the mercury reed switch or the mini switch, micro switch contacts are just not robust enough for motor applications. And that's why many of these fail, in my opinion. The last time my float failed, I simply bought a new float that had about six feet of cord to it. And then I spliced that cord You can see that it's about six feet. It's actually a little longer than six feet. So that connection is very high off the ground. Once you get your new float installed, I made this little control box. All it is is a double gang electrical box. And as you can see, it has two wires coming out of it, a black and an orange, which I'll walk you through in a moment. And then it has an outlet on the front and this outlet, I put this label on here, it says pump only. What's happening here is the pump is plugged into my control box and not plugged into the back of the piggyback. So let me walk you through the connection. So here's the way to think about this. This is the piggyback plug. It has my new float on it and it's plugged directly into the AC power, just the way it always was. The next thing that's plugged into it, though, is not the pump. My control box is plugged into the piggyback. And what's in the control box? Inside the control box is a power relay or a small motor contactor, in my case, those power relays, which are motor horsepower rated, that's really, really important. Make sure the relay you have purchased has a motor horsepower rating on it. Current rating in amps, in my opinion, is not quite as important as the motor horsepower rating. So make sure that the motor horsepower rating at 120 volts or 125 volts is suitable for the pump motor that's in your pit. Power to the relay coil is provided by this black cord. And then the last cord I'm gonna plug in here is this orange cord. This orange cord is power that goes to the relay contacts and the relay contacts provide power to the pump. So what's happening here is that the float switch is only controlling power to the relay and the relay draws a very, very small amount of current. And therefore, the float should last a long time because it is not anywhere close to being stressed. It's only controlling literally milliamps of current to energize the coil of the power relay or the coil of the contactor. The relay that's in this box here is controlling all the power to the motor or all the power to the pump. So you think about it, the relay that's in here is not in a nasty environment. It's not moving up and down. It's not being uh, subjected to a lot of moisture 
or uh, anything else that's going on in the pit. It's in a nice, clean, controlled environment. And then if it's sized properly with a motor horsepower rating, it's going to be quite reliable. So that's it in a nutshell. The float switch controls the contactor or the relay coil. And the power coming off this cord is controlled by the relay contacts and determine whether power is applied to the pump or not, not applied to the pump. The relay that I use on my next installation will most likely be something that looks like one of these enclosed relays. Let me just give you an example here. If you look up this part number, this relay has a one horsepower motor rating. Or a relay that looks similar to this one with a different coil. You can see this one has a one horsepower at 125 volt AC rating. And this relay right here, you can also see that it is rated 15 amps, but it is also has a one horsepower at 125 volt or 240, 250 volt rating. So the horsepower rating is really important on these relays or contactors, whatever you decide you're going to use. So here's the spec sheet for this relay. And you see it's a 30 amp rating, but right here you can see that it has a switching current at voltage and you can see it says 30 amps resistive load horsepower 2 horsepower at 240 volts 1 horsepower at 125 so this relay is plenty hefty enough to be able to control up to a 1 horsepower pump two bits of information would be one the AC coil on the relay or the contactor should be 120 volt AC and I would recommend against using solid-state relays. They're awfully cheap. You can buy them from Asia for three or four bucks, a 40-amp solid-state relay with a 120-volt control circuit. And it will handle a substantial amount of inrush for a very short period of time. Since solid-state relays are generally not motor-rated, and you don't know really how long it's taking your pump to start, I would recommend against solid state relays. Additionally, I believe it's common knowledge or the prevailing thought is solid state relays generally fail closed. So that means if a relay, a solid state relay fails, your pump is going to be energized and running. And you definitely don't want to run those pumps completely dry for a long period of time. So for that reason, I recommend a contactor or a relay. Uh, contactors and relays, when they do fail, generally fail in the open state, which means power will not be going to your pump. Thanks for watching, and I'd appreciate a thumbs up if you found this entertaining or interesting or informative.